Hey guys, today I want to present the solution to the European Girls Math Olympiad 2024 problem 3. At first, let's take a look on the problem statement. We call a positive integer n peculiar if, for all divisors d of n, we also have that d times d plus 1 divides n times n plus 1. Our task is to prove that if we have given four different peculiar numbers a, b, c and d, the greatest common divisor of them is equal to 1. This means that these four numbers here have no common prime divisor. And therefore, we can reformulate the problem statement and say that our task is to prove that for a given prime number p, we can find at most three peculiar numbers such that p divides them. So the first thing we want to do is to consider a fixed prime number p and try to get some properties about all peculiar numbers that are divisible by p. Let n be peculiar in such a way that p divides n. We can directly use the given condition for the divisor p of n to conclude that p times p plus 1 must be a divisor of n times n plus 1. This condition here on its own is not really strong. And therefore, our goal is to try to find another divisor d of n such that we can write down a similar condition and put them together. A natural choice for the second divisor d of n would be n divided by p. And therefore, let's define k in such a way that p times k is equal to n. So k is a positive integer. And now we know that k times k plus 1 also divides n times n plus 1. At this point, I want to note that if n is just equal to p, then the first equation here is obviously true. And in the second one, we have k equals 1. And since the right side is divisible by 2, this second condition is also true. Moreover, p and 1 are the only divisors of a prime number p. And therefore, n equals p is indeed a possible choice for n here. So we have already found the first possible value for n and therefore it is left to prove that there are most two more values for n. To do this, let's take a deeper look on these two conditions here. And first of all, let's write our right hand side in terms of p and k. So we have that n times n plus 1 is equal to pk times pk plus 1. The second equation tells us that k plus 1 divides p times pk plus 1 and now we can subtract a multiple of k plus 1 from the right hand side and this divisibility condition stays true. And here a good choice is to subtract p squared times k plus 1 because now we get rid of this p squared times k term. This is equal to p minus p squared. We see that the right hand side is negative and therefore we know that k plus 1 is less than or equal to p squared minus p. If p is a small prime divisor, then we see that this inequality here is really strong. But unfortunately, we don't know this. However, we can do similar arguments for the other prime divisors of n. And therefore, let's write down the prime factorization of n and see what we get. We write that n equals the product from i equals 1 to l of pi to the power of ri, and here we want p1 less than p2 and so on, less than pl and ri greater than zero. This argument here with p1 instead of p gives us that n divided by p1 plus 1 is less than or equal to p1 squared minus p1. Multiplying by p1, we directly get that p1 to the power of 3 must be greater than n. Using the prime factorization of n and the fact that p1 is the smallest prime divisor, we can bound n from below by p1 to the power of the sum from i equal 1 to l ri. This immediately tells us that 3 is greater than the sum from i equals 1 to l of ri. And here I want to note that we have already dealt with the case that n is equal to a prime number which is just the case that the sum here on the right hand side is equal to 1. And therefore, the only case that is left to deal with is the case that this sum here is equal to 2. We get that we can write n equals p 
p times q, where q is a prime number. So by definition, k is equal to q. First of all, let's take a look at the case that q is equal to p. And here we see that p plus 1 divides p minus p squared, which is nothing but minus p times p minus 1. This would imply that p plus 1 must divide p minus 1, but this is clearly impossible. So the case that q equals p is impossible, and we can assume that q is not equal p. Now let's take at first a look on the case that p is less than q. We again use this divisibility condition here, which tells us that q plus 1 divides the right hand side. Moreover, since q is greater than p, we know that q plus 1 cannot divide p minus 1, and therefore the greatest common divisor of p and q plus 1 can't be equal to 1. Since p is a prime number, this directly implies that p must divide q plus 1. Or in other words, q is congruent to minus 1 modulo p. We want to use the first divisibility condition for our next step. And here I want to note that the only difference between these two divisibility conditions is that we switched p and q. Therefore, this divisibility condition here is also true when we switch p and q. And thus, we get that p plus 1 divides q times q minus 1. We already know that q is greater than p. And thus, if q is not equal to p plus 1, we know that q and p plus 1 are co-prime and can conclude that p plus 1 divides q minus 1. There is only a problem when p plus 1 is equal to q, and this is only possible if p is equal to 2. But then p squared minus p is just equal to 2, and the left-hand side here in this inequality is greater than 2, which is impossible. And therefore, the case that p plus 1 is equal to q is impossible, and we conclude that p plus 1 divides q minus 1. Or in other words, q is congruent to 1 modulo p plus 1. Using the fact that p plus 1 and p are co-prime, we can verify that q must be congruent to p squared minus p minus 1 modulo p times p plus 1. Using this inequality here again, we know that q is less than p times p plus 1. And therefore, this directly implies that q must be equal to p squared minus p minus 1. This implies that we get at most one solution in the case that p is less than q. Let's take a look on the second case that q is less than p. Here we can use the same argumentation to get that p is equal to q squared minus q minus 1. Since we know that q squared minus q minus 1 is strictly increasing for q greater than or equal to 2, we know that this equation here has at most one solution for q. And therefore, we get that in this case, we also have at most one solution. In total, for a fixed value of p, there are at most three possible solutions for n, and therefore, we are done. <laughs>